Hi everyone, welcome to Art and Talk. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Leslie Sue, the host for Art and Talk. If you've been watching us for a while, thank you for your continued support. If you're new to us, Art and Talk is all about meeting artists and being inspired. We embrace traditional arts, we embrace the spiritual arts. We aim to dive into the mind and heart of each artist's guest so that we can gain deeper insight, a deeper perspective of their art, their message, and their process. We're an open platform and we honor each artist's journey. So again, welcome and uh, thank you so much for being with us. We are continuing today to bring you another talented artist from the Being Heard, Being Seen exhibit, which is currently on view at the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County in Lake Worth Beach, Florida. We hope you've had a moment to check out some of our other artist interviews from this exhibit as well. So Being Heard, Being Seen honors the LGBTQ plus community through thought-provoking artworks by Palm Beach County artists. So today our guest is a visual artist, although he has much experience in many of the arts, such as 3D, sculpture, and ceramics. We'll be diving into his art and his journey. And let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Juan Carlos Bidera Cabrera. Welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Juan. We're excited too. So you have such a rich tapestry of experience, in the arts and in a diverse um, array of different disciplines in the art that kind of make up your, your current visual art curriculum, so to speak. Um, so you were involved in the arts just as a, a young kid. You know, my mother always said she used to give me crayons and paper and she knew that for the next four hours, she didn't have to worry about me. So I think that developed the a creative aspect of expressing myself. And I was not really much of a talker. So that allowed me in certain ways to express what verbally I wasn't able to express completely till four years old. Um, that range of expressing myself any way I wanted to. So I think the arts and for me, I use it much of a, an expression vehicle and also as a therapy. So it, the, the therapy part, one, um, is through expressing your emotions and your feelings that you just tapped into, is that correct? Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you were saying, you know, um, early on, you were, you were very young, and um, it, it were quiet when you were young, and thank goodness for your mom to give you those crayons and, and drawing instruments, because it seems like it just opened up this whole world where you could express yourself and... Um, really release certain feelings and, and, and emotions that are going on that weren't coming out verbally. Now, as you um, began to uh, grow and, and get a little bit older one, were you still kind of like a, a quiet and reserved or did that change? I think for the most part, I mean, um, for those that I feel comfortable, I'm very, I'm, I'll talk to, to the wall. I have no problem with that. Um, I don't like a spotlight. I think um, I hide away from that. Um, so for me, it allowed me, and this is stuff that I've worked over the years in different um, ways. Um, I had to, when I was in grad school, uh, since I knew English and I was in Spain, they had me interpret in front of with cameras and everything. Every time a new artist came in from Japan or the United States or whatever, they had me interpret when they couldn't find somebody else. And I'm glad they pushed that because it developed that um, I spoke Span Spanish, but it was, um, it was very broken. So it wasn't until I got to Spain that I was able to completely speak it and then jumping back and forth for that. And that ability came from the being pushed to translate. So I'm, I think over the years, I little by little broken that shyness barrier or whatever, but I don't consider myself a shy person. I consider myself, I, I, I 
I speak when I have something to say. If I don't have nothing to say, then I kind of stay. I like watching. I like the serving. I I think that's where I that bird's eye view of things is where I love being because I'm able to analyze everything that's going around and see capture certain moments that the naked eye would not like stop to look at. That is so beautiful, Juana, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, before we tap in a little bit more to your art, what are some of the things that, that you observe? Because you're saying you, you feel like you're an observer, the bird's eye view, which is such an amazing perspective to hold. What are some of the things that you see that you feel like maybe others don't tap into? You know, um, I think in my journeys, because um, I took two years where I was backpacking to um, Europe, and one of the most um, that I miss, I really, I wish I could go back to those and I wish I could travel more at this time, but I can't. Um, I miss, I never knew what a hummingbird was until one day I'm like, that looks like a butterfly. I'm like, wait, no, it's a bird. Like little things that like, if you don't stop to serve in nature, it just like sunrises, sunsets, like I never realized and it sounds weird, it really does. Um, but the sunsets and the colors here, for instance, are a lot different than the colors in Spain. And when I went to Amsterdam, the purples and the pinks, the orange, it was just a lot brighter. They, they had something in it, you know? And I think sometimes with our busy schedule in life, we don't observe those sort of stores stuff. So being a keen observer of nature, which is a strong influence in your art, and also like the colors that, that you observe too, which, which play a part. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to tap into these um, pivotal experiences that you've had. You tapped into uh, one of them for us, where you um, had this experience in Spain and um, uh, in the glass program, and, and you had been saying that it also, um, one of the roles you played was also to be an interpreter as well, which kind of, as you were saying, helped you to kind of break through some shyness and whatnot. But you had this really interesting um, glass experience for a, a while that really helped to kind of shape your, your mind, your hand, your heart, your eye as an artist. And you also had a fascinating journey, if you could tap into of your um, excursion, um, you've even coined it a spiritual journey in, it really was. in Europe with your sketchbook in hand. Can we hear about that? Well, um, let's see. Um, I was not supposed to go into the art field whatsoever. And it's funny how things sometimes work out. I had just arrived, I was 21. I had, I was living here in the United States and I had my own business doing murals and bow finish. And, but I had this urge to just, I want to know my roots. Like I want to know Spain or whatever. So um, after much discussion uh, with my family members, um, I finally just bought the ticket and they couldn't say anything about it. After spending all that money, like, you know, I was like, what are we going to do now? Um, but I got over there and my plan was, um, originally I really wanted to see the world. So I wanted to go backpacking. I wanted to see a little bit of Spain. Da. And my mother's like, please don't tell your aunts and uncles that you're going to be doing that because the bohemian in the family, it's really not well seen. So in order to hide that, I got, um, I got there and uh, I got forced to um, join in the unemployment. And there was this flyer or whatever that um, said that if you like to draw or, you know, it, it was a glass factory. I had no idea what it was. Um, come behold, the next three days, I'm going over there which was like four hours away from where I, where I was staying, taking a bus ride over there, doing an interview, coming back, packing my bags to go back over there because the course had already started. So I got into that and I don't know if like you ever had the witness somebody glass blowing. There's a bit of a magic and 
especially when you see liquid and solid having like a dance and playing back and forth and the only thing that um it's keeping it from it it's how much you control the warmth or the cold of the piece and you can play with that but you got to be very careful because if you go too extreme in one thing or too extreme in the other thing you lose the piece and it's very magic especially with the colors that i don't think the camera sometimes can even capture what a naked eye captures face to face when the piece is hot and it has all these colors and if it has colors in itself like a blue could be a red you have you really don't have interpretation of the color when the piece is warm because of the chemical reaction with all the um, materials in it it changes the color so when you see the piece at the end after it's cooled down it's nothing like you imagined it the colors are all completely different so that's something you have to have in consideration when you and my journey through backpacking through Europe actually happened towards the end of my journey in Europe. I spent 10 years. And the last two years, um, it was during the crisis and I still had that urge that I wanted to travel and explore. So um, I just went, I had nothing else to do. Like work was not really providing anything. And I had some extra money. So I journeyed to Amsterdam. I wanted to go to Amsterdam. I saw a documentary on Amsterdam and I started from Bibao, Spain, which is the north part of Spain, to Amsterdam. And in Amsterdam, I stood there three months and then the cold was coming. And I'm, I'm a Florida guy. I grew up all the time with traffic. So <laughs> I was like, you know what? These canals here and all this moisture, not going to be a pretty sight. So I journeyed backpacking from Amsterdam all the way back to Spain, because I had for Christmas, a Christmas market, because at the time I was also doing like jewelry with glass beads and um, these paper mache beads that I made and then hand painted them. Once they were dry, they were really hard. And I also did with though, with that mixture, I did small pins that I did like little portraits. And it was fascinating because I used um, cutouts of the magazine paper and when you sand it down, it looked like um, you see the bits and different pieces of, of the color of the magazine paper. So it gave like another dimension to the paintings. I love this whole journey and this whole like wearable art pin and then the glass beads. So you were already using your knowledge from your glass program into really kind of some, you know, tapping into some different marketable ways to use your art and, and be able to. Um, well, the funny thing about that, I'm sorry to cut you. Um, the funny thing about that is that since I've always been in art classes all through my elementary and middle school and high school years, I played around with a lot of mediums. So actually I took more knowledge from that working with acrylics watercolors um ceramics wiring and stuff like that i was able to bring all that in a weird way into the glass form because when you paint on glass um it has a little bit of that watercolor technique that you're working on so and sometimes it's hard to grasp how you develop that on top you know that you always want the, the light to shine through. You have to control um, how much paint you use or whatever, because what you really want is it would be like in watercolors, you really want some of that the white paper to shine. Those are going to be your bright highlights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think I got more knowledge out of that incorporated to the glassware that I took from the glassware. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like kind of like each step of the way you were you were growing and growing and expanding and expanding from all this different knowledge that you were exposed to and that just kind of kept unfolding in, in your journey. Which is very interesting how sometimes like the journey that one follows through, like little by little, you add up and it's like you look back sometimes and go, wow, you know how certain things connect and intertwine with each other and form 
other creative vehicles. Yeah, that's that's so beautiful and, and uh, very deep and profound, Juan. Thank you for sharing that. Um, before we um, look at some of your art, um, what, what are some of the messages that you want to convey? We know that emotion and feeling is, is still important for you and, and colors and textures and, and nature and all these experiences. You know, that's actually something really, um, and it's so funny because um, it wasn't into the, this exhibition that I had realized it. It was like a light bulb just went off of my head. Um, you know, as of uh, any artistic individual and especially when you don't play sports, you don't really intertwine with any male, what we typical male things like cars and stuff like that. I had no interest in that. Now, I could decorate a house for Christmas. Like my father used to love Christmas. So that aspect, I would like shine. So I always, for some reason, felt like a pal from uh, the male figure. And I really connected with the female as not only because I come from a very strong woman and I'm a uh, big activist on the woman of role and how it's really not as appreciated as, as much as she should. Because uh, my father was a great guy, but if it wasn't for my mother next time trying to, you know, my mother would be like, okay, this is this, this is this, this, this. My father would be all over the place. I'll get it done, but it was just not it. That was it fast enough. So that female mothery role, and I always felt comfortable with that. I always felt safe. Um, so it's quite interesting how I've always kind of looked at females and painted them and drew them and um, had that and how I express my emotions or whatever in a weird way it's always through a female, but because the viewer's more easy going to understanding the pain if it's a female, if it's a man, they shy away. It's like, you gotta get hard, you, you gotta get stiff, you know? But if it's a female, we're able to let down our guard and just see the beauty in it. And that's how I got started painting portraits of females. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's really kind of like your your current um, visual voice structure and focus is is kind of like on the female portrait and being very expressive with your color, with your texture, with your shapes, and you have some interesting influences that I can see through through your art. Yet in your own unique way, like Klimt and Picasso yeah. and Dali. Um, can you touch upon like what was it about these artists that you just resonated with? You forgot one, Frida. Oh, okay, Frida Kahlo. Okay, very good. Um, you know, I don't know if it has to do with my roots or whatever, but um, I love Clint's way of uh, expressing sexuality, and um. Most people don't know he was a very sexual man. It had a lot of love. Most of the ladies he painted were actually lovers of him. Um, but he had the symbolism in it that I really caught my eye. And then um, the colors, the golden, that. And then Dali, I love Dali in a sense. Um, it was a vehicle that I saw that I could express reality, but without it being so harsh to the eye. Frida, I love all the nature, all the flowers. And I think that's one thing I had to grab from her. And Picasso was just, the mind was an endless vehicle of creating whatever you want it. Mm. That's beautiful. I, I love that. And I, I can see that love and reverence that comes through your art. I think this would be a good moment. Let's take a look at some of your images and have you provide some commentary. Now, I know this first one is a, a recent guest that we, we just had um, from the Being Heard, Being Seen exhibit. So what's going on here, Juan? Well, um, Rolando, um, as you know, he. He's the owner of the Box Gallery. Um, Rolando, actually, my first 
exposition and a group showing was at his um, gallery. And that was back in 2018, where I did um, a big painting that I later went on to um, did at the Street Painting Festival. So for this right here, um, he had a silent auction that he was making all these birds for, um, I think it was a, a LGBT related issue. And he had asked me if I'd be willing to make a bird. So he cut out all those are for bird forms, what he's known for. So each artist was, took it how they wanted and created what they wanted out of that. And I didn't, know what to do with it because I, I like nature. I painted birds before, but I didn't know what to do with the figures. So little by little, I started going into birds and I found the king's bird. I think Kingfisher's bird. I think that's what's called. Um, and I love the, the shortness of it, just fit the frame or whatever. And I just, from that came this. And that actually got sold. And it, and it got sold before the auction even started um, by um, a friend of a friend who saw it and wanted it. And it got a really nice bid on it, really nice. I mean, she basically closed the bid with it. Mm. Juan, can you share with us, what are some of the materials that went into creating this? That's actually all wood. What I did with that is that um, I carved out some of the wood with um, wood tools and I actually burnt some of the wood off. So when I did like, a wash on top of it, it had that muddy look on it. And then I just built on that surface with acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful one. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next one. Oh my God, I, I sent you, I, <laughs> I'm so sorry for sending you that picture. I didn't realize I had a side on the bottom. Uh, that was um, commissioned by um, some collectors of mine. And uh, this actually has a very interesting story. Um, this palm front fell from a palm tree at their house. And I had already done a mirror at one of their houses that they sold. And um, they had a couple paintings of mine, a couple prints of mine. And this palm front fell. And the wife, she loved it. And she's like, oh my God, let's take it to Juan. Let's see what he could do with it. So like this, I had actually like, when I got it, it was all like, it dried up, but like it rolled up kind of way. So I had a little by little form it, shape it, jet sew it, but it's a palm front. And they wanted for the theme of it, uh, a Jamaican woman. So the woman is a Jamaican inspired woman with tropical flowers and all, Flowers native to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful and you know what an amazing material to paint on and just the way you work, you know, within the shape and what you included. And it, it's just a very striking portrait. And again, your, your expressive um, use of color. And of course, going back to tying in with the, the female um, as a subject matter, but yet this was a commission piece and that's, that's what you're saying that they wanted us uh, specifically to for you to visually represent also. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay. Now that piece, um, that piece, um, I sold that piece. I did that piece last year um, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, um, it's called Phoenix. And it had to do with like looking for hope and trying to recover whatever we have lost during the pandemic. So the ashes on the bottom kind of are evaporating and turning her figure into that Phoenix. And she's still looking for in the sky for like that hope, like we can rise out of this. Mm -hmm. The lady, the ladybug that's on the branch, that's a representative of luck. And the string between the two nails represent how it's all tied together. And it, the world that is created around her is almost like an altar. If you look at it, like if you, it kind of reminds me of the Greek um, authors and author, uh, sorry. Um, but 
it's very imaginary or whatever. It's like surreal, you know? There's two sons in the picture. Um, it, it, I think it just has to represent what the pandemic was in the start. It was just, everything was closing. Like we didn't know what was up from down. Like there was a loss of our normal ways that we didn't know how to fit that emptiness in it. But I wanted to paint something that we could, even though we were, we can rise from this, we, that we can go on from this, kind of inspire that hope in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and first of all, I love your creativity and the symbolism that you incorporate in, in your beautiful elaboration. So it's really um, coming birthed out of uh, the pandemic and as you're expressing one, um, bringing a sense of hope, the phoenix rising from the ashes, moving forward, moving on, but yet also, kind of tapping into, like, as you were saying, things are up, things are down, things are different. This, this is what's going on. And, and there was, you sort of tapped into that, sort of that empty, unknown space to really beautifully represent this. And I love your connectivity. It seems like your, your mind, your awareness is always like connecting things. And, and, and that's such a beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, the interesting part of that, it's, it's yeah. really interesting how I, I do my backgrounds. My backgrounds, especially like I'm just throwing down um, color and just trying to figure out what the painting is trying to tell me. But in a, in, a, in a way, I'm actually therapy for me to express those feelings of frustration, whatever I'm feeling that I'm connected to it. I'm not a red and orange or yellow person. I'm not. But for some reason, the last few pieces that I have done in those colors, I don't know if it's just, the frustration linking with the fact that I really don't feel that comfortable with those colors, but it expresses a lot to the viewer and the paintings I do with those colors have sold. So something in there, there's, I got to tap back into something, you know, there's something good there and I, I'm still trying to explore that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so as you're saying, and, and what you tapped into uh, earlier, Juan, is that art is also very healing and very therapeutic for you. And um, so here is this beautiful, like, you know, also like dreamy, your yeah. imagination is just really expansive and very exploratory. Yes, very well, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. No, and I thought that was interesting, Juan, because you said, um, as you were explaining the process that you went into to create this, you said that you were trying to figure out what the canvas, what the paints were telling you. That, that's, that's very interesting, so your relationship to the canvas and to the paints. It's, it, what it sounds like is that it is speaking to you and you're just you know, kind of determining, okay, what do you want to say? And then you just follow through, is, is that correct? Yeah. Well, in the process of it, it's you're, you're I think you're, you're tapping into those feelings or what you're trying to communicate off in that painting, but it also allows you to move on to the next process because if it wasn't for the beginning process of it, I wouldn't have an image in mind that I wanted to look at and one was searching for. Now she, um, the image of her, I found her on um, social media which normally I either type in words or, or something to link to that. And I just start looking, you know, yeah, this one's good. Let me move on to another word, da, da, da. And that's how I come across some of the um, ladies that I paint just by, for instance. And I bumped into this photography of this um, girl who was Asian inspired, but she was very in a dreamy, and the red tones in her eyes really went well with the painting. And then the jacket was all like, I made that up with the feathers and stuff. I, I made all that up, but it allowed me to go in there and search for this and this and this and this, this is what I want to express. And whatever I find out of that led me to another journey. Mm, yeah. Thank you for explaining that and, and love the symbolism in that one. Okay. Now that I just did um, the end of March, um, the street painting festival. Mm -hmm. Now um, it was the first time, in, I think in two years that we haven't done it. And um, I was looking for an image and my mother had 
while going through her stuff, she had this old photo of her in her 20s, which I thought was gorgeous. Um, so that led me to, this is what I'm gonna do. The original photo was all in black and white. It had no flowers or anything. It was just a regular ID photo, you know, that back in the days, it was just a laminate piece of paper that would put together. So from that, um, I actually did it with my niece. Um, and we did it as a sort of a surprise for my mother. Um, my mother at the moment, she's losing her memory. And um, we believe we still have to go to the doctor and see what's going on. Um, but it might be a depression and not Alzheimer's, dementia forms because it run, dementia runs in her in family. So we believe they're early stages of that. And I wanted her to connect being such an independent woman. I think the worst thing is like seeing her kind of lose her own value of herself. And when I looked at that picture, my mother was gorgeous and she had no makeup. She's never been a lady of wearing a lot of makeup. She's been very simple off her life, but she's a very strong and independent and up for her. Like I'm taking this and I'm running with it. Like no, nobody can stop me, you know? So I wanted her to remember that essence of her. And I did this portrait with my uh, niece involved surprise my mother on Sunday. So we had to like rush it, get things done. And meanwhile, I was working at night. So it, it, it turned out very well. She didn't quite recognize um, the photo of herself nor the, the, the painting. But once she told her, um, she remember. And the funny thing is, I think I had this on Instagram, the video of her she had like a circle of people waiting for her. Cause we were like, you know, I was trying to like have it all prepared for her. I didn't want to die. And all of a sudden a circle around her. So she had her own little spotlight for like 15 minutes, which she had no idea, but she had a smile from one side to the other side. I think she enjoyed that. Oh, that's such a great story, Juan. And what a beautiful tribute uh, to Thank your you. mom. Yeah, absolutely. And so beautifully executed. Um, I, I have gone to the street painting festival and just been in awe of the artists and, and, and what they create. Um, can you give us a, um, a rough estimate of, of the size of this one? It's an eight foot by 10 foot. Mm. Yeah. Wow, this is amazing. All right. Now this lady right here, um, it's this I did that at the, I was in an exhibition at the South Florida Fairgrounds. Um, and I had her along with another painting. Now it's funny because this painting right here refers to the LGBT community. That veil, if you look at it, there's triangles all the way in the back and that little pink line in the background, she's in the forest. The flower is supposed to represent of the individually persons that are included in, in the LGBT community, each flower is different. Now, her, she has this veil, this transparent veil that you, it's beautiful, like there's pearls on it and it shines. Very hard to photograph because it has a lot of um, fluorescent paint on it, mm -hmm. but it gives like this kind of um, ghostly thing and you can't really tell whether it's, a man or a female. Now your eye goes to looking at it, thinking directly as a man, but the more you look at it, it makes you kind of question that. And that's the mystery that I wanted to have the viewer kind of question that stop looking at the physical and look in the inside of each individual. Mm. So part of your message one is for the viewer to think and go to a place that kind of transcends gender and to look at like the, the inner aspects of- um, The spirituality of the person, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, 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 beautiful. And wonderful that you sold that too. Yeah, that was the, and, and you know, I kind of, I feel bad because I really wish I would have kept that one. 
that's one of those paintings that you do you, you like let go but you feel like an arm being turned off you at the same time but she started it all in the sense of like going into all these different um motifs of ladies that i'm i've been doing it she's mm -hmm. the first one i did oh, okay. i was doing a lot of like kind of there was there was a women image there but i it, I was traveling, so like it was more nature. It was like more people on um, bikes, uh, fields, stuff like that. It re really wasn't like front center as the main statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. All right, so now here we go to the being heard, being seen at the mm -hmm. Royal Council. Your your paintings on exhibit. Now, those three paintings there, I actually have four there, but these three in particular, um, they're touching very different topics here. Um, the one on the top of the yellow jacket, she has a butterfly and she has a, a daisy that's like bent. It's not broken, it's bent. And then she has kind of like a, a saint with bullets all around her. And on her neck, she has a chain of a gun. So it's an ironic kind of Virgin Mary interpretation of how we perceive peace, but at the same time, we create weapons. It, the logic doesn't compare. And then we must play a blind eye to certain things and not to the other way. And that's why in the background, she has two different paths. One's a black road and the other one turns into like a, pro, uh, a road with like uh, rocks and stuff like that. It's the surrealness of the two paths that doesn't make sense sometimes. And, she, and that's why she's silencing, like, shh, like it's a little secret, you know, but we're gonna look the other way. The one underneath of that one, um, she's a friend of mine. Um, her name's Anya, and she's the first transgender Latin female to um, teach law at Harvard. And she's surrounded with this frame that's like kind of frozen still in life. But in that, there's all these flowers that are blossoming, whatever. And she just went into full female. I think about two years ago. So that was caught into the moment I was painting that. Like I wanted her self to come out, out of that frame, but that, that frame was always there in some ways. Even when I knew her as a guy, it was always there. She was still in there. You still saw that, that feminine aspect of her was still in there. And how at times, even though we know that's there, it's hard for us to uh, break them away from that frame and see them other ways. I don't know if that makes any sense to you in any way. Mm -hmm. Sure, but yeah, yes, absolutely. That, that painting, and then the painting of Melissa St. John, I've known Melissa St. John since I first started going out to the club scenes and stuff like that. And, um, we connected over the years back and forth from my travels. And now like I, I talked to her and the one thing I admire her the most is that no matter what, all these years, there's one thing that has never changed about her. How humble she is and how she's always willing to sit down and talk to anybody and just listen in the community, regardless of who they are. So to me, when I first wanted to paint her, um, I've always considered her, even though she's a guy, I've always considered her like a lady, a classy lady, because that's how she, when she gets into that persona of character, that's how she goes about. So the crystals on that, it's like the bottom of a chandelier, it's like the crystal just shines light everything. And the painting, if you look at it closely, you have a bit of like a rainbow motif going all the way around and all these like botanical um, flowers that she picked out. The lilies and all that were 
um, flowers that she gave me when I came to her. And I was like, give me three flowers, give me three colors. The colors on that, the background colors she picked out. Because I was trying to get away from that comfort zone of always using blue tones and colors that I like. So I asked her to give me three colors, three flowers, and then I just went on from there. Everything else, she sent me a picture. My mind just went on. And then I like the lilies that they have like um, lipstick that instead of having that, um, you know, normally what lilies have, uh, I forgot, there's certain kind of lilies, I can't remember, but they normally have like a little stem in the center and it's normally like a yellow or whatever. I ran around this image of like lipstick. I was like, would they just be great if I just put lipstick in it instead? I mean, she's basically given that energy of pride which I think she's always done and uplifted the community from within both personas of herself. Yeah. When I was in the exhibition space, Juan, and, and I was looking at these, um, I just was really floored with the um, expressiveness, with the, the symbolism, which now I you know, know a lot more from, from hearing your your commentary and, and what you put into it, you know, as, as the artist. And they're, they're just absolutely magnificent. And so you are like a visual storyteller. Exactly. I think I, I love, and I'm trying to get away with so much detail, but I, um, it's funny because I, I was talking with somebody the other day and I go, you know, sometimes I lose myself in putting so much details because if you see that chandelier, like the way it like the light flickers or whatever, but that's just my process of building the canvas up. Mm -hmm. And then I go really crazy with details, but I think, and so much wanting to tell what I'm feeling, what this person means or what I'm trying to get across to the video. I get so caught up sometimes on the detail that I, at times it's like, I can't let go of it. You know, like I, I need to step away and walk away and like, you know, it's done because I could lose myself in details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's interesting, you, you have that innate awareness of like, okay, I'm getting a little too fixated on the details and then you, you kind of know, okay, let me just step away. So you, you kind of like prompt yourself in, in the process. Well, I'm a back and forth, like going, I think that's so important. It, it like, I, I think that it's very misunderstood. Like w when somebody tells you, Oh, but how long did it take you? I was like, well, I mean, actual working. I mean, sometimes you need those moments to step away from the painting to kind of see from a different perspective of where you want to go. Sometimes you're so involved in a painting, you can't like you can't see that, and you need that maybe the ten minutes to just sit back and like, you know what? Okay, it needs a little bit more in this corner. I just need to take this color and kind of floor it all the way across the canvas. That creative, that's a creative process. That's part of the journey of creating it. I can't tell you how much time I lose in it, but it's so important to have that because otherwise you don't have the right come out. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important point that you brought up on that part of the creative process in the execution of an art piece is the reflection. Is the, as you were saying, is this stepping back and then kind of going back to your kind of like love of the bird's eye view and, and kind of getting the whole picture. So there is that activity and then there's that non-activity where you're in a reflective state. You're not really painting or doing anything, but you're just in that assessment mode of, of creating. And, and that's really beautiful. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and go to this one. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. That painting has, has to be one of my favorite ones I've done so far. Um, that painting, as you can see, the background, there was so much texture, so much colors that I was not very comfortable with it, but that came around last, no, I think it was, it's going on two years now, um, doing the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement and I was just so wound up with so much unjust so much discrimination so much like feelings of trappedness 
an er, like rage that the background was created and it ha- the, that background has a lot of texture. Now from there on, like I told you, I went to the process of looking on, I ran into this model. She's actually um, a model for Vogue in Milan and her name is Aksana. And I ran across this photo. Looking at her profile, I started looking at everything she wrote and thought, and it drove me more into her because she uses her platform as a model. Um, she's albino. So she preaches and she um, act, she's a big activist on her profiles, spotting the light of what's still going on in South Africa with a lot of kids that are albino are either kept in the basement, mistreated, or their limbs are being sewed and chopped off. So to me, and that defining what the frustration, what was going on here, not only here, but internationally, and having this other issue that I was not aware of it, because I'm thinking we'll live in times that this doesn't happen. Like, this is nonsense. Like, what do you mean they're chopping off limbs? They're chopping off limbs. And we're lit, this is today. We're not, it's not like 20 or 100 years, it's today. So I love that fact. And in this picture, she has that posture of a very strong woman. Her eyes are closed because she's afraid to see what's still going on. And she has this armor that we all put on each other and a beehive that the bees are kind of building her back up. But there's a strengthness in that piece. That square in the background supposed to be the square minded mind of a of not being able to see past that square point of view and there's a light that's shining through but it's not completely shined the flowers are all made of flowers there and that just means that we're all individuals as we are and like we're so caught up on sexuality we're so caught up on um, the physical essence of it that we lose track of at times that we're all just human beings trying to do the best we can. And we're the same, we have the same blood as you. We're not mammals, we're not other species, we're human beings. Juan, I love the the human element that you bring out and to really in a sense, um, kind of going back to some of the other things that you were saying is really kind of transcend the the physical in a sense and just get to like the heart of the matter just that that human element transcending differences differences and that connectivity again that that oneness that unity can you imagine a world where if we were all the same that'd be a boring world to me i think in our differences and understanding it doesn't mean you have to change my mind but the understanding of how somebody has developed a point of view, it's where we connect and I'm able to understand how your journey was. I don't have to agree and jump on the same boat, but at least I understand your point of view and you can understand mine. That's communication. I think we got, we've got gotten to a society where instead of powering people for their differences, we discriminate we critique and thought because they're not like us. A world where everybody's like me would be a boring world. I like the differences of sexuality, of skin color, of different cultures, just a sense of different cultures. I'm a big food person, so I love all types of food. It's in that where I found a connection more than just staying with my own kind. And maybe that has something to do with the fact that my backgrounds, I was born in one place, raised in another place, and probably another place. I don't know, but it just, my mind in that sense works where the more different, the more I want to know about it, the more I'm interested. I'm not interested in the color white. I've seen white all my life. But if you put some purples and this shade has that, that that's where my, my heart and passion runs to, you know? Yeah. 
That is beautiful. And, and I'm so grateful that you've shared that. And you don't really shy away from any emotion, any feeling, things oh, yeah. going on in society. And yet you have this very, um, it's not so much like in your face. It's a very almost kind of gentle yet uh, very rich contemplative symbolic world that you you bring us into and all the different messages and all the different ways that you you want us to think and it's just so uh, creative and imaginative and and um you know the influences of of artists that um you know you, you've kind of taken in as you know part of your um your you know artistic expression and your artistic voice it's it's so very um beautiful and it's like you bring us to this state of like like changing reality and it's like you bring us in that magical spot i'm so glad you said that because that you see why the artists that i'm influenced by and i got you see where my art i've taken their what i saw in their work and what they try to express in, in my work mm -hmm. with all the symbolic the surrealness the creating these these images that they don't exist and in all of nature mm. Juan, we have to wrap the show up now. Um, we always have our guests provide the closing comments. If there's anything else you want to share in regard to your art, or if there's any advice that you want to give maybe any painters um, who, who might be watching, and then let us know how we can stay connected with you. You know, I'm going to take you on the last thing you said. Um, advice that I give to young artists that are coming here, um, starting off, do yourself, um, meaning, I think in art world, we pay attention to what everybody else is doing. I'm not saying that's not a good thing, but we lose our own individual journey in the aspect when we're so caught up in everybody else's doing, just do you. Sooner or later, that's gonna be recognized through your work. But if you're caught up on doing, this person's working with that, let me go work on that. This person's working on that, let me go work on that. You lose that beauty of the journey, a individual journey that you as an artist pursue. And besides that, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> I kind of lost that words. <laughs> well, those are beautiful closing comments. So really stand grounded in your in your truth and your authenticity. You know, be you know current in what's going on, but but you know, find that that individual um, aspect of expression through art and uh, through uh, different areas. And let us know, Juan, how, how can we stay connected with you? Well, I, um, I, I'm on Facebook. I have um, an artist page on Facebook, Juan Carlos Badia Cabero. And then I'm also on Instagram, and it's J-B-A-D-I-A-L-A-B-E-R-I-N-T-O, which means Juan Badia Lavarinto. Lavarinto, it's a word for um, mace in, um, in, in Spanish. I have a mace tattoo, so I, I kind of like goes together. Like we're all going different journeys, but we're all gonna meet up at the same place sooner or later. The maze I have, it's it looks like it's different path, but the path is all one path and we're all going to the center. Mm, oh, that is so beautiful. And again, so deep and, and profound. Um, before we close out, Juan, um, can you just uh, bring us up to speed? What are some of your uh, current art projects and endeavors that you're working on? I have um, an event that um, I just did a pop-up um, art exhibition at the last remaining bar um, in West Palm Beach, which is nonsense because if you grew up when I was going out, there was clubs, there were bars everywhere. This is the last remaining bar. Um, I did an Amish or honoring to the members in our community that are known, that we've lost in the last two years, the drag queens and unknown people, kind of like bringing them all together. Because I think a lot of times in our community, we lose that aspect of knowing who the other person is and treating each other as human beings. Um, now, from that, I'm doing uh, another exhibition where I have this painting right here. And these little triangles are messages of um, positivity and hope that other people have sent me. 
And I wanna fill a whole room up with this. I have 50 right now, but I think I'm gonna need a lot more. So what I want, it's kind of half from this painting that I call Hope, the triangle kind of dispersed across the room and then go into Dion Jefferson's triangles. He has 12 canvases of triangle shape painting. So I think the whole little triangles turning into the big triangles of his painting, it's gonna be really beautiful. In a, um, it's like a wine bar, he's gonna be singing. So that's gonna be on the 26th and the 27th of this month for Pride. There's some exciting projects. I was right there with you and in, in how you were describing the, the you know, envisioning the, the space and, you know, once it's complete. Thank you so much, Juan, for sharing your art and your journey and the rich symbolism and the beautiful messages. Thank you so much for being our guest today, Juan. Thank you. I really did enjoy the interview. I was very nervous, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you for making me feel home and warm um, to be able to share it. Uh, you're welcome. And thank you so much, Juan, and much success with all your endeavors and stay in touch with us and let us know all the different projects and um, artistic um, activities that you're involved with. I surely will. Thank, thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching Art and Talk. As always, we appreciate the time you take to watch our artist videos. And do take a look if you um, haven't had a moment to watch some of the other artist interviews from the Being Heard, Being Seen exhibit. And if you're local to South Florida or just happen to be traveling through the South Florida area, do take a moment to stop at the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County in Lake Worth Beach, Florida and check out the exhibit. It runs until April 9th. And if you're not local, you can always go on their website, um, which we have a link to on our Facebook Art and Talk page. You can just jump on that and check out the current exhibit and you can see some of the other artists that are on the exhibit and some of the artwork. All right, so we'll talk soon on the next Art and Talk. Until then, be well and be blessed.